Hi, my name is Grace Anderson. And I'm Rajwell Gaturi. We are members of the Seven Days Kindness Youth Leadership Team. On behalf of the entire Seven Days team, we want to welcome you all to Others Day 2020. We are grateful to you for tuning in virtually. Others Day is all about placing ourselves in the shoes of others. Frequently, we stay away from others, treating them differently or less than. Today, we strive to engage with others to find commonalities to bridge the gap between us. In order to bring the spirit of Others Day into fruition, I am pleased to introduce to you Mindy Corcoran. Mindy is a thought leader, entrepreneur, and former CEO of a successful wealth management firm. Mindy experienced tragedy in 2014. Her father and son were murdered by a white supremacist intending to kill Jews. Mindy took action. She established the Faith Always Wins Foundation and its signature community event, Seven Days Make a Ripple Change the World, designed to overcome hatred through acts of kindness. Today, Mindy will engage in dialogue with Wesley Hamilton. Wesley Hamilton is a gun violence survivor, father, entrepreneur, athlete, award winner, and inspiration. In 2012, Hamilton was left paralyzed by a random shooting that left him both mentally and physically strained. With his daughter as his motivator, Hamilton went from a non-athletic single father to a world-class athlete. He founded Disabled But Not Really, which spreads the message of the importance of good mental and physical health in overcoming life's challenges. He was recently featured on season four of Queer Eye, where he was further taught to be true to himself and to continue to be the inspiration he is. With that, please join me in welcoming Mindy Corcoran and Wesley Hamilton for From Survival to Revival, Living Your Best Life After the Unthinkable Happens. Thank you, Grace. Thank you, Raj. You all did a fantastic job at introducing us. And I am so excited to be talking with Wesley Hamilton. We met previously uh, in Wes's gym in Kansas City. And then I had the pleasure to interview Wes on his on my podcast. And it was literally, we were interviewing, I think, two days before the Kansas City Chiefs took to Florida and won the Super Bowl. And so, Wes, I just want to tell you, we did it. We were so excited when we were doing that podcast, and we haven't had a chance to celebrate or maybe fist bump each other. <laughs> you are so right about that, but I'm excited that we won, and I'm excited that we're back able to connect and share this story. Yes, thank you. So we do have some prepared questions and then we also have some questions that were sent in when we reached out and asked our committee and the youth on our committee, what would they want to ask someone like Wesley Hamilton about how he has survived and been in such a resilient state since you had a tragedy happen to you. So I'm going to get started just with in the moment of receiving very difficult news and the news I'm talking about is someone said to you that you won't be able to use your legs again. How did you find the strength and the fortitude at that moment to move forward? Just going back to that day, I didn't have strength to move forward. Um, I think that it was just having faith. Faith gave me the ability to um, be guided through that journey. But at that moment, it was instant defeat there was no reason for me to have strength when I had just found out something that I couldn't even accept. It was the hardest thing for me to um, even like look at my own self in the mirror and, and, and see the new change. And so I think more or less, it was just having faith of what could be and having at that point I was in denial as well. You know, I thought that I could be that, you know, amazing story of a person that walks again after finding out that they never was going to walk again. And so that faith of believing that I was going to be able to do it and I would be that miracle story is what really at least guided me into what the process that we'll share going forward. Let me continue with my question also and that and add to that. So I love how honest you are that it was really difficult right then, right when you heard about it and that you had that hope. Was there one conversation or an act of kindness that resonated with you that started to spur you on? Was there any kind of, um, you know, pivot, pivot that helped you move forward when you realized you weren't going to be that miracle person that would walk again? <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, 
the best way I could put it, all right, let me put it this way. Um, it was a process. It took months and months of denial for me to even have the strength to accept. But what had always been going on through this whole process is me being a single father. I had just got custody of my daughter a couple months before my accident actually happened. So for me, even though I was defeated, I was still a father. And you think about something that could just pull strength out of nowhere is the fact that I knew that my purpose in life, it was bigger than me at that point. It was more or less of how can I help this little girl grow into this world and not really focus on where I'm going to end up. And I think that that was at least that, that pivot moment for me. Parenting will do that for you, won't it? It's something special, you know, it, it, it truly is. Great. So we're going to pass the baton now to Raj and she has a question for you. Thanks, Mindy. So how did your experience in moving from the unthinkable relate to the challenges that we're facing now with the coronavirus pandemic? In this current uncertain time, I think that uh, my journey itself relates just because of overcoming something that, like you said, is unthinkable. Um, at this time, we don't know what's going to happen. Uh, we're still all kind of guessing. But what I do know is that this is a perfect time for us all to focus on ourselves. And um, what got me to get away from, you know, the unthinkable of me not walking was just the fact that I, I had time to focus on me and being able to build that, uh, the person that I am today happened through those moments of uncertainty. And so I think that for, you know, the world right now, of course, we are all kind of trying to figure out what's going on, but there's no reason why we can't build ourselves into the, the people that we envision. There's no reason why we can't use this time to be better at a certain skill or a task. And so my whole journey from learning that I was gonna, I could never walk again, I became a person that started walking by faith. And so I look at like people that are going through things right now and you're uncertain, but what can you do? What type of faith can you have to give you the ability to be your true self? So when you are able to enter this world again, you have everything under control and it starts with yourself. Okay, so going off that as well, um, vis a vis the pandemic crisis that we have found ourselves in, how do we address the physical, mental, and emotional pain that we are facing, especially when we are fearful for the future? Oh man, that's a good question. It's really, really good because I feel like we're all dealing with some type of mental, mental, physical, or emotional pain right now. We're just going through it. Um, my best advice is to one, write your pain down, right? Like write it down on paper. Um, I found that when I was able to put my pain down on paper, I actually took it outside of me, you know? And so I look at it as if I have my pain wrote down, I can always go back and reflect on it, but it's not controlling me because it's not inside of me anymore on an emotional way. And so I just feel that, you know, with all the pain that we are dealing with mental, physically, emotionally, we're all going through hardships of some sort. Um, it is, it is just a great time to really like look at yourself, look at the things that you need to fix upon yourself, but also release those, that bad energy out of you, right? Like we got to look at four walls most for next month or so. Uh, yeah, and I feel like if you're going to do that, then you want to be able to be confident with who you are. And so this is just a perfect time to just build yourself and literally prepare yourself for what's going to come. I think that if we're not prepared right now for the uncertain times, we can at least prepare ourselves for the times when we get out. And we don't need to have that pain that we've carried on entering this uncertain time to be with us as we get out of it. So I just believe that put your pain down on paper, talk about it, you know, rather it's on voice record, anything, because that is a way now that you can have the ability to reflect on it 
but it's not controlling you. Yeah, thank you, Grace. That was a great that was a great question. And and uh, Wes, I have you know always been taught to write down goals, but I had not heard about writing down writing down specifically the pain. I think that's a wonderful piece of advice to um, to offer to all of our viewers. I think that's fantastic. Uh, so I'm going to move us to empathy, and I we we have the question for you. How could someone best demonstrate empathy to someone when we can't actually see uh, what might be causing them pain? Sometimes just being empathetic doesn't necessarily mean that you know particularly what that other person or subject or is going through. You know, it's just really just being able to, it's really just being able to understand that they are going through something. And I think that, so for me, when I think about empathy, let's say I serve people with disabilities. I think I can use the example better. So I serve people with disabilities, but if a person with, that's an amputee comes into my gym, I do not understand their pain. I'm not missing a limb, you know? So them missing a limb is completely different than me actually still having mine and not having use for it. But what I can, what I do know is that they can become better, that they can be empowered by the things that are become looking like destruction to them now. Like I can at least help them from a, a point of view of me building my own self and showing them a better way. So coming at them at a point of saying, hey, I've been defeated too. I don't know your level of defeat. I do not, but I share that defeat. But what I do know is that people that have been defeated can overcome. And so if you're at the lowest point of your life, then you can overcome. So I think for us, we, we shouldn't have to find a way where um, we, we're trying to figure out or trying to understand that exact pain or what that person is going through, more or less of just saying, okay, we all go through something and most likely it's gonna be different. Just understand that someone's going through a tough time but your position on an empathetic point of view is just to empower them, to tell them that, look, we're all in this together. It might be different, but trust me, you can make it through this because I've made it through it. Thank you, thank you. I love that. And then just recently I heard Brene Brown did a podcast on uh, collective grieving and comparative, um, comparative grieving and comparing our sadness and our grief from one to another. And so many people probably look at you and can see that you have a disability, and, but, they, um, but they don't know exactly what that means. But when they look at me, they don't see that I have grief. But if they know about what happened, they lower their level of grief. And they say to themselves, well, I can't be upset about something because look what happened to Mindy. But like you said, very eloquently, we all have our own to deal with and to hold, but we can, um, we can hold hands and share that together. So I appreciate, appreciate that answer very much. Corcoran. I'm with Seven Days Make a Ripple Change the World and uh, Disabled But Not Really is one of our 14 charities and also uh, Wesley Hamilton is our featured speaker on Others Day. So we're really grateful to have you with us Nakia and um, so tell us a little bit about you and uh, Disabled But Not Really and how you got started with them. Um, so I actually just moved to Kansas City last July uh, from Colorado Springs, Colorado. Um, my boyfriend actually does Wes's why videos and a lot of his pictures that you see on social media, my boyfriend does them and he 
introduced us. Wes was looking for an admin assistant and that's what I was looking for. So that's how I got connected with him. Um, Disabled But Not Really is a great program for um, anybody that has a physical, mental, emotional disability. Um, our mission is to instill the <clears throat> undeserved disabled community a physically limitless mindset that breeds courage, courage, confidence, and competence. Um, our vision is to be an environment where anyone that is limited by circumstances beyond their control have a safe place for growth. And so you started last July. So how long has the gym been open? How long has been disabled but not really, um, you know, starting to be effective and make a difference in the Kansas City area? I believe West started three or four years ago. And mm -hmm. I think this is our second second year at the gym. Okay. And of the athletes that come, because I am very blessed and lucky I have not been disabled. And so I don't know, and I don't want to ask anything that sounds like offensive, but it really asking out of curiosity, um, what types of disabilities are people coming with? Like what, what's their ranging from? I know that Wes is uh, disabled from the waist down from gunshot, you know, mm -hmm. that. And so what about the other people that come in? So we have a few right now in our February class that had multiple sclerosis. So they are kind of just stuck in a wheelchair already. Um, we have two people that were in a car accident and they were paralyzed from the waist down. Uh, we have a blind gentleman that's been working out with us. And then last October, we had a stroke patient work out with us as well. Um, so we have, we have an older lady, she has osteoporosis, so she just kind of has a harder time working out in general, um, but we have just wide range of it, really anybody. Yeah. Well, that was really helpful. I'm glad I asked the question. I felt a little tentative about asking, you know, what defines your athletes? I didn't, I didn't ask it that clearly. I could have said, what defines your athletes? Which sounds like a great question. <laughs> no, you're fine. Um, but that's really helpful to the people that are looking at at this video later and they're wondering well disabled but not really like maybe they don't even consider themselves you know disabled um, right but but I love that you gave that um, extra information and so how is COVID-19 uh, making changes to what what changes are you all making because of COVID-19 um, with the gym and the athletes so the gym's actually been doing some online videos uh, for the athletes, they've been posting, um, there's an app that we have our athletes download and they've been posting home workouts. So even if you don't have the equipment and stuff, we're still trying to make sure that everybody's working out. Classes obviously can't really go on right now, but Wes is doing what he can to post some videos. Our other coaches are posting videos, just trying to make sure we stay in contact with, with all of our athletes. The athletes who do come, do they pay a fee to come? How do you all get revenue to run your programs? So uh, we have, for the scholarship program, everybody um, basically gets qualified for the scholarship that we have. And then that pays for the majority. And then we, uh, we just ask that they pay a $60 fee and that's more for, um, owner ownership of it uh basically like you paid so we want you know you want to come you don't want right more of a drive uh wes is thinking about maybe switching that up a little bit but for the for the full eight weeks it's just sixty dollars and they can take the class as many times as they want as well okay and what kind of um following do you all have of people that are not disabled but they really appreciate what you do, like I do. So what kind of following do you have of that in terms of maybe social media? I mean, do you feel like that they offer support? I mean, if I became like, I wanna be an advocate of disabled but not really, what would you want me to do? Uh, we count on volunteers, okay. um, but our following is all over the place. Uh, I have actually a lot of my family and friends back home in Colorado follow Wes. Um, they wanna see stuff like that out in Colorado. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. So I would say our following just varies. It's a pretty big support group. Um, I don't, I'm not in charge of our social media, but I follow the page as well. And I'll go through the messages and the comments and people are just 
really supportive and really nice. Like they've never seen anything like this before. And they say it's, it's very eye opening. And I would have to agree just working with these athletes. They're great. Like it really shows you what you can do. So I'd like you to give me a little bit more elaboration on um, the athletes that you've met um, mm -hmm. that, that, you know, what, obviously I don't want you to give any names for privacy's sake, but athletes that you've met and how you've seen them transform since they have joined Disabled But Not Really. Oh, yes. Um, so um, my first class was in October and I can say that was probably the, the the very first one and really the one where I got to know most of our athletes. And that group was by far probably one of the most eye-opening. There um, are our gal that had the stroke, she was probably one of our hardest pushing athletes. You know, she, she's a single mom. She wanted to get back in there for her kids. You know, mm -hmm. um, she was, she was great. She was very motivational. Um, our blind gentleman, his personality is probably just as big as Wes is. He's always smiling. He's always motivating like his, his other, his fellow athletes. Um, he's very big into like singing and voice recording. So if he knows it's your birthday, he's going to sing to you. And it's, oh. it's great. Like his personality is just, um, awesome. One of our ladies in a wheelchair, she was pretty shy in the beginning. Um, but she's opened up a lot. Like you can just tell each day that she comes in, she's, um, I don't know how to say it. Like. Not that she wasn't friendly before, but she's just more interactive. You know, do, she's, do you think she do you think she has more confidence in herself now? Definitely. A lot of them do. Um, you can yeah. definitely by the third by the third week, you can tell that they just that they start feeling better, just like anybody else that works out. But I would have to say our our stroke, our stroke lady was probably one of the most like better changes throughout the program. Yeah, so that was great. So, um, so Makia, thank you so much for your time today. Thanks. Are you good? Uh, no, I think so. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. You too. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Raj, we're going to go on to you now. Do you ever, or did you ever, think about revenge? Who is the target of your revenge? Or, or just in your, in your head? Yeah, that's good. That's really, really good. <laughs> um, you know... <sighs> I grew up, I grew up, uh, I grew up pretty rough, you know, and I think that uh, a lot of it just uh, was more um, based on my own lack of confidence, lack of self-esteem, um, and just really not really having a direction uh, or guidance to people teaching me to be myself. And so with that culture that I was, uh, that I was around for so long, revenge literally was the next step after I opened my eyes up and um, and revenge was going to go directly to the person that put me in this position. Um, and the point, the point it, behind that was just because of the culture that I was raised in. It was always revenge. I mean, there was, it kind of felt like you were back. You, you wasn't, you didn't show strength if you wasn't revengeful. Right. And um, so for me, that was that was the approach. It was literally, uh, yes, I did want revenge. I didn't want revenge on a personal level. I still didn't even understand why it happened. I just knew that the cycle that I was used to revenge was the next thing to do. And it wasn't going to go toward anybody that wasn't a part that wasn't a part of that particular situation. But Yes, I my at least my first couple months, all I thought about was revenge. I hated who I had become, and I felt like I had became this this person due to the hands right of someone else. Of course, now I look at my story and I take accountability of my actions that day, and we we'll go into that. But I know that at that time, yeah, I mean, I was disgusted with the person that I didn't even look at myself in a mirror for two two or three months so i hated who i was 
and I wanted everybody to pay. So one more piece to what Raj asked, and I think that I, the way you answered that was so powerful. Who, you, you kind of said that you were almost a target of the revenge too, but who was a target? Was it everyone around you or you or the person in particular? Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, thank you for even breaking that down more, Mindy, because I, 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 I honestly feel like we would have missed it if we went more, more forward. Um, <laughs> I didn't, I didn't love. So I want, I was, I was seeking love in this situation, right? Like I had this revengeful heart. Like I, I, I had a lot of hate on my heart, but everybody was a victim for my revenge. Anyone that came in contact with me felt the negative energy that I had inside of me. Like there was no way that you couldn't come by and say, probably leave and say, I don't know if I want to be there no more. You know, like I hated myself and you felt that every moment you came into my home or my presence or just my space because you would have felt it. It didn't matter if you told me it would be okay. My response would say, no, it's not. This is not you. This, you know, so yes, my revenge, even though it was, I guess, directed toward those that actually put harm to me, right? Like, but because I, because they wasn't in reach, that everybody that was in within reach was the ones that actually felt the hate that I had inside of me. Yeah, oh, that's very powerful, and it's and it's and it's, I can feel it. You know, you, when you talk about it, I can and I can see the other people who were part of the interview process. We're all like nodding our heads, and we can feel what you're saying that you were emanating that anger and that revenge. And I, we really appreciate your honesty in that. I think that's so powerful that you are honest, that it didn't just wash away and you were miraculously decided to be kind and resilient. I'm going to um, elaborate a little bit more kind of down that path. So the trauma has now happened to you. How far reaching was the impact uh, like from you? Where did it emanate to? And how, how many other people in your life did it affect at that time? And how did that uh, affect you in turn? So, um, <clears throat> great, great question, always. <laughs> um, my circle had always been small. Um, I couldn't be, I wasn't a friendly person growing up. <laughs> uh, I didn't just go out and have like this whole like Rolodex full of great contacts or people I network with. I was really like one of the, I, I was, I was shielded off from the world, I would say, um, due to my own situations and circumstances. Growing up, my circle was completely small. I mean, I just didn't have that 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 drive to actually go meet friends. Uh, I think one of the sayings was like, no new friends. So I just kept it that way, right? Um, but what I did have, I had a best friend. I had um, brothers. So I call all my best friends my brothers. Um, I had my sister, my siblings. I had my mom, my dad, and I had my daughter. And I had uh, my daughter's godmom. Um, her name is Kino. And um, I had Kino. And so uh, those those people, uh, my basically in, intermediate family, um, they were the ones that was affected by it. Um, they, you know, they, they caught every, every whiffed of all my emotions. Rather it was a good day or a bad day, they felt it. I mean, you didn't even have to be around me to feel it. I would probably call you to let you know. <laughs> I, I, you know, when I, I felt, I wanted people to love me when I didn't love myself. And so everybody felt that, you know, everybody felt it because it was constant pressure. I couldn't accept who I was, so. But what that did for me, well, it allowed me to end up being alone. See, I pushed everybody away from me because of my negative views and the way I saw my life. People didn't, you know, nobody really understood what I was going through, but they knew that I was living and they wanted me to live and not be defeated. But I constantly was defeated because of my own thoughts as well as how I thought society was going to view me. And because of the pressure that I felt of the opinions of others, it allowed me to take my anger out on the ones that was close which eventually pushed them away from me. And I found myself in, 
confined to four walls, defeated. Okay, that was really good. So at the beginning of the outbreak of COVID-19, um, many people thought that it would only affect like the elderly. So they were less empathetic. And only later did the community begin to consider the downstream impact of the virus to the homeless, to the poor, students, um, and many more. With reports of violence happening every day and people becoming desensitized to the situation, how do you get people engaged, get them to care and have some sort of positive action take place? I think my approach in this current situation has been really to redirect. Um, it's all about perception, right? We can all look at this situation and say, oh man, I'm confined to, I'm confined at home. I, I don't have, you know, no finances right now and I'm not going to school. I'm being a teacher right now and I'm teaching my daughter, right? So like all these things we can look at as problems or we can actually look at them as something that's gonna better ourselves. And so for me, especially with my audience, I've tried to show people what you can do at home by staying at home, but I've really been gearing people to say, okay, you know what, this is a trying time. The weather's beautiful, right? So what can we do um, that takes ourselves and takes to make this a little bit more serious? What well, change your perspective of the whole situation? Well, instead of looking at it as a pandemic and, you know, yes, there are people dying, there's so much, there's a lot going on, right? But what if we all just said, okay, this is a perfect time for us to sit at home and take control of our lives. This is a perfect time for us to do a little bit more. This is, this is time when we told ourselves we didn't have time. So like for me, what my audience is, we all, nobody's perfect. And we all have improvements that we can, we can focus on. Well, this is the time to do it. And if we can take our minds off of actual, all the negative in the world and understand that if we start putting positive into ourselves, then that is what we can give the world once we leave here. So for me, there is a lot going on. I mean, I'm used to violence. So of course, for me, when I started to hear people dying, I wasn't in denial about it affecting me. I was more on the, on the fence of, okay, I'm used to it. And, and even though, yes, it, it has been worldwide, it just didn't hit us or the, the America didn't take it as serious, right? So I think that because of that, we have to redirect because we didn't take it as serious as everybody else. And so now it's hard, it's kind of been hard to try to allow people to take it serious. So I've just changed the way that I perceive it. And I would tell anyone else that comes around me to change the way they perceive this situation. Instead of focusing on the effects that it's having on the world, focus on the effects that it's having on you and how that you can change them. Because yeah, we might, you know, there are people that are laid off, but that doesn't mean that you can't have a line of resumes ready. That doesn't, you know, that doesn't mean that you can't, uh, you know, get a new skill. You know, we all know that healthy eating and uh, exercise is a great way to build your immune system. So how many people are learning how to cook right now? How many fruits and vegetables? So it's again, it's just changing your perception of the craziness that's going on in this world. And just focus on you and your life. Focus on the things that you can control. That is how we get over this. If we can't control what's going on in Europe, I really don't want to care what's going on in Europe right now. I am very, I'm a prey and I hope that everything gets better. But I need to focus on what I can control here. And so I just feel like if we could tell people to um, stop trying to control things that they have no control over and focus on the things that you actually have control over, then you will make it through this situation. Because again, we all have room for improvement. So use this time to improve yourself. So Wesley, you have literally changed the world. You are making world changing um, announcements all the time and you just did it again. That was, that was very mind blowing to us that in the situation that you're in where a lot of people would say, 
oh, he's, he can't walk, he's disabled, he was shot, it's gotta be really difficult for him. And yet, and you, and you probably do have down days, I'm not saying that you don't, but, to, but your positivity just is exuding and, um, and that resilience is, um, is a great ripple effect. And that goes with what we do, you know, make uh, seven days is make a ripple change the world. And you're making ripple and you're changing the world the question here is, what um, what efforts do you uh, feel like happened to you along your path? You mentioned Kino when we talked in my podcast, and you mentioned your daughter a lot. What uh, happened in your path that helped you reach that positivity and get you to be the world changer that you are now? Okay, so... <laughs> When I grew up, growing up, nobody showed me how to be myself or nobody even guided me on the processes of learning how to accept who you are, you know, and being able to be your true self, learning what vulnerability is. Like no one taught me these things. So I think my level of defeat was uh, an eye opener to like what life could be, right? Like it was, it was, it was more or less, I was so far down that there was only I, there was only a way up. It was either going up or committing suicide. So let me be real, right? Like, so I tried to commit suicide at least four or five times. I didn't want to live again. I didn't accept myself. But see, I grew up in a world where nobody taught me how to be myself. And everybody was trying to fit in. See, the culture that I grew up in is a completely different. We didn't have entrepreneurs. We didn't have people that taught us how to, what success looked like. So there was no one I could follow besides a path that I could not be in no more because of my situation. And so for me, it was no, I, I was defeated. I just wanted it to be over. I remember just retracing those moments and saying like, why didn't this happen? Why didn't that happen? Why didn't I just close my eyes and not be here no more? Because I hate myself, right? Like all this. So what happened? Well, the fact that I had sole custody of my daughter was a huge impact for me. And because I had amazing friends like Kino and her family, they had a different heart for the things that they did or the way that they, their outlook, their perception of life, right? Um, and so for me, my daughter didn't see a disability. She just seen her father. So one, that was enough. But those that were around me started to visualize that too. It's like, there's more to that. And I had my friend Kino, which I, um, <sighs> Kino showed, I was, okay, let me put it like this. I was very, very hateful this whole time through the whole process. But Kino never showed emotion toward the emotion that I showed her. Um, it was always just love and passion and, you know, and just the understanding, the empathetic point of view of like, I get that you're going through it. Like, did not paralyzed, never went through nothing, doesn't know anyone, but just understanding that it is hard. And I'm, and just being there and saying, look, I'm gonna guide you through it until you find a way to accept. And me being around someone that could control their emotions, at least till they left here, right? Like, I don't know what, I know that my words were very harsh. And I know that the negativity that I had at the time was bad. So only thing I could think is that to witness someone so strong to be attacked in such a way and then come back the next day with the same heart they left with, oh, that showed me strength that I never knew. See, I, I was used to people that reacted at the moment of emotion. And I was dealing and facing people that didn't react to my emotion, but still showed me love. I think that was honestly the moments that I started to see light in, in, in the midst of darkness. Thank you. That is very helpful to people who are in a supportive role of helping someone for them to know that they are making a significant impact and it may not they may not be told uh, by that person that they're giving care to or loving on or taking food to 
but the fact that you explained very eloquently the importance of Kino's friendship and her steadiness in your life, that's very helpful to people to understand how to be a caregiver and the importance of it. We're going to pass now on, I'm sorry, did you want to say something else? I do, I do, I do. Okay, please do. <laughs> I just wanted to say, you know, um, outside of, you know, the caregiver part, you know, and Kino, um, the strength that she showed, but then we have a different aspect, right? Like I, I'm a mama's boy. I always have my mom. My mom's always there. Um, if anyone's seen the Queer Eye episode, it was more highlighted on the strength that my mom had through this whole process. Well, when my negativity spurred it, spurred, well, it pushed my mom away. I pushed her away for the most part. She probably didn't want to leave, but I didn't want her around. It was just a lot of conflicting moments. But I remember one day when, I mean, my mom didn't like uh, the way I vented to others. She didn't even like the way I vented to Kino at times, you know, like she didn't deserve those things. Right? And so I remember one day my mom telling me that instead of me venting to anyone else, I would vent, I can vent to her and she won't show no emotion. And I think that too, for caregivers and spouses, the understanding that we have to vent to someone and we got to let it out but that you do not allow that to shift your energy, you are just being that wall for us, that helped in ways that I'm still seeing it today. Because I know that if I get emotional, I can stop for a minute, or I have that mom or that friend that I can go to and, and vent. But now they have the ability to vent to me because I have that same shut off system like they had. Thank you for elaborating. Thank you for going forward and elaborating. So now we're gonna go on to Grace. Grace has our next question for you. Okay, so this is a little different from what we've been talking about, but I have to ask, what was it like on Queer Eye? Hey, <laughs> the good question, dog. Um, you know, you want the honest truth? Of course, we're gonna give you the honest truth. What was it like? It was different. It was very different. Um, I'm going to constantly go back to the way I was brought up. And the way I was brought up, I couldn't see myself surrounded by five men. I don't even think that was part of the culture back then. And I think that if it was part of the culture, the people that were, um, you know, <laughs> the people that were kind of had a shield where they wasn't open right because of how everyone else looked at them so i didn't expect what happened i kind of just after i did my research to be on the show i said okay maybe this is fitting um but once i got around the guys uh i think you could see and i've built this rapport for myself like i can feel energy i can sense people i can bring them around you seen like five free men right like i can't i don't even want to say gay i don't say any of that because that didn't matter for the energy that i seen people coming into my home meeting a complete stranger and giving me everything that's inside of them right like in teaching me it was amazing it was amazing because i couldn't I, I wasn't at a point where i could judge them for who they were because they were open enough and vulnerable enough to give that to the world. And so what I got from that was that you, you know, let the world accept who you are once you can speak your truth. And I think that that, that energy itself is what made that whole show and episode so powerful and so fun. Everyone wanted to get to know me. It wasn't like, oh, we got this script and let's just do this. I mean, the moment they come next to Wes, I mean, you had producers like, hey, hey, y'all got to stop. You know, y'all got to stop talking. We're supposed to be filming. But it was, they were genuinely wanting to understand. Here come that empathy part. They wanted to understand everyone that they served and helped. And so they didn't want something that was structured. They came in and wanted to actually know you. And I think that was, uh, I think that kind of put the icing on the cake to give me the ability to be comfortable around them. 
because they didn't care about, they were, tell me about your past. Ooh, that really happened? You know, like things like that, they were excited and they wanted to know more, but then they still taught me how to speak my truth in a way that I wasn't feeling the pain, right? It was an amazing experience, y'all. And it was one that um, truly, truly helped me become who I am today. Wes, it's lovely to meet you. Thank you. This is the first time that we've actually met. Yes, it is. And um, we are excited that the Urban Scholastic Center is one of our 14 charities for seven days, Make a Ripple Change the World. And um, we're meeting this way because of COVID-19, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But what I'd like to know is, tell us just a little bit about you in particular and how you came to be at the Urban Scholastic Center. Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, so as you shared, my name is Wes Parham, and I... I ended at the USC, um, I guess in a combination of ways. Essentially, I had two paths that were really intersected in my life. One was that I worked in higher education since I finished college. I was a first generation college student. And when I finished, uh, I recognized that my first job out of college allowed me to make more money than either one of my parents had ever made. And I was doing something that I would have done for free. I was a communications major. <laughs> And I would have gone to talk to, and I was doing college recruiting. So I was just going to schools and talking to students. Uh, and when I recognized that that's what education did, I decided I'm helping everyone do this. And so, uh, so my career really followed the goal of how do I help everyone uh, to do and accomplish education? And so that's how I came about. And that was one. The other piece is that um, I'm, I've always been highly involved in my faith community. And in my faith community, I found my niche with uh, youth and children. And so there are, you know, in my, in my mind, there are two types of, uh, ministry people who work with youth and, and children. There are the, what I call the closet senior pastors, the people who want to eventually go on and, and run a church. Uh, and I am not that one. I'm the other one who's just like, Hey, I just love to see kids grow and develop. And, and so the USC, kind of met both of those uh, two passions in my life. It, it was an opportunity to continue to uh, pour education into as many people as possible, and then an opportunity to uh, work with uh, children and youth and helping them to develop and be the best that they could be. And so that's kind of how I ended up at the USC. So Wes, what is your role at USC? I'll call it USC too. Sure. Uh, I am the executive director at the Urban Scholastic Center or the USC. Uh, and I've been in this role for uh, coming up on two years, actually. So uh, not too long, but I, I've been around the USC actually uh, for several years. The founder of the USC, uh, Chuck Allen, uh, he, myself, and my wife used to help plan a conference in, here in Kansas City uh, for years. And so I've known him for, for probably over a decade. Uh, and then when he transitioned out of the USC, I stepped in uh, about two years ago. Okay, okay, fantastic. So what does the Urban Scholastic Center do? Well, in a nutshell, um, we provide educational uh, enrichment uh, and, and support uh, to K, pre-K, at this point, pre-K through 12 students. Uh, we actually have four challenges the organization focuses on. So uh, providing mentorship, uh, providing cultural enrichment and uh, helping to eliminate the book deficit in Kansas City, Kansas, uh, providing, closing the educational achievement gap uh, for individuals and providing healthy meals and healthy lifestyle um, through uh, encouraging exercise and providing meals for the community, so. So it sounds like a lot of people helping need, are needed to help the 850. So how many staff and volunteers do you all have? Well, uh, <laughs> we have a lot of, we, we don't have a lot, we're a small staff. Uh, We've got about um, eight full-time people, uh, okay. two part-time people, one part-time office manager, five student interns. So these are high school students 
um, who we we hired to come on uh, and work with us, and then one bus driver. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, Mr. Gary, he comes to help us out, uh, and that's our staff. And so, all the things that we do uh, are mainly staff driven. We do have some volunteers who come. Uh, we do an event called Soul Food every Wednesday, so we have groups who come in and provide meals. We have uh, volunteers who come in and work with our after school program. And, and so if I was to count, you know, all of the various volunteers throughout all of the different programs, they're probably about to be about maybe 40 to 50 active volunteers. Um, but one of the things that we, we understand is, hey, we love volunteers and we need them. Uh, but we also understand when you're working with youth and children in particular, consistency matters. Uh, and so most of our programs are driven by our staff. I, I they just are, they work diligently and, and, uh, and more than I can pay them for <laughs> to, uh, to provide those services. But uh, we're always looking for people who, and, and that's a little, maybe what's a little unique about us is when, when we look for volunteers, we're really looking for people who can make about a year commitment um, is, is, is ideally what we're looking at for whatever it is that they're doing. So, you know, if it's, hey, I'm gonna bring in meals for soul food. Well, over the course of the year, we need you to commit to doing that at least three times or four times, uh, you know, versus, hey, I'm gonna do it one time this year because that's not gonna provide the relationship with our students that we're really trying to cultivate. What would you like to say to people who are new to you? What, how can they help? You know, what, how can they, how can they, and then how do they make a connection um, with USC? Yeah, so I think the easiest way to make a connection with us is on our website. We actually have uh, a section where you could just click in and it says, do you want to volunteer or if you want more info? And if you do that, it actually submits directly to us and we'll reach out. But there's a lot of ways for people to connect with us. One of the things that we love people to do constantly is uh, what we call book packing. So every month, um, we deliver three books to every student in two elementary schools in Wyandotte, Kansas. So uh, they get a bag with their name on it and it has three books for them to keep in it. Uh, and so coordinating, getting those books packed and making sure that they're screened and, and making sure that they're at the appropriate reading level for the grade and things, that oftentimes requires a group. Thank you. So how has, Wes, how has COVID-19 changed anything that you do and how you do it? Well, it's changed a lot. You know, as I shared with you, most of what we do is with students. And so uh, it requires kind of gatherings and, and things like that. And, and that's been, it's been challenging uh, because we can't do that. Uh, so we're trying to figure out how do we continue to build those relationships, mentor our students, provide the resources uh, for them to succeed uh, in a virtual format. And so some of the things we've done is uh, we actually, have went on and bought a bunch of online learning licenses uh, for Lexia and for IXL, which are uh, programs designed to target learning and just provided those to parents uh, and to families and then sent them a mock schedule and structure of what that learning might look like for the rest of the year. So you might look at covering this module on this day and you might look at having a daily schedule that looks like this uh for your students as you're doing this homeschooling and so that's one of the things we've done um you've been fantastic do you have anything else that you just want to say that i didn't give you an opportunity to talk about no no i just want to say uh thank you for this and and to everyone listening i, I hope that you're sheltering in place and safe and, and uh pray that you know that you're able to to to, to deal with this pandemic in our country in in a way that's uh both mentally and physically healthy. So I pray that yeah, for everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Wes. It's been wonderful to meet you. And, um, and we are happy to showcase Urban Scholastic Center this year. Thank you. I'm so excited. So I heard through the grapevine that you are literally able to climb a rope that is suspended from the ceiling. And I think that's super cool. So I was just wondering, like, how did you work up to that? Like, what kind of training did you do? How many tries did it take? And just like moving from the perseverance that you had to have to learn to do that? Seriously? You know what's crazy? <laughs> this is so crazy. I never did anything prior to my accident. I never worked out. I never ate healthy. None of it. So when you think about what a lot gave me the strength and ability to climb up a road with my wheelchair attached, 
I think it was just courage and confidence. See, I had found myself after a while and I started to fall in love with myself. Nutrition really gave me the ability to actually love who I was because I lost weight while I was paralyzed. And I lost a hundred pounds to be exact while I was on two years of bear rest, which was 21 hours a day. It was the toughest time and very debilitating time. And I still lost a hundred pounds because I wanted it that bad. Well, that gave me the ability to say, it doesn't matter if I ever did it. I just got to go do it. And if I want it bad enough, I succeed in it. And so when I grabbed that rope, I remember climbing the rope the first time. I didn't have my chair. I'm not going to lie to you. I didn't have my chair. But I went up so fast. It, it shocked me because I had never climbed the rope. My first time trying, I climbed it. And so I said, oh, okay, this is cool. But for me, I didn't like the way my legs dangle, you know, because they would dangle as I climb up because I don't have no function in them. I said, all right, I'm going to challenge myself. And the first time I put this chair on it, I went up. And I think it was just the will, the determination, but also the courage and confidence that I had in myself that I could push myself past my mental limits. And this was a limit that I had set on myself mentally that I was never able to be physically active. Could never thought, I never thought that. And so for me to be physically active or determined to be active in that way, that's all it took for me to climb that rope. It didn't take more than one try. It took determination and, and, and faith. Just the belief in myself. I believed in myself that much and it carried me on all the way up to the top. Okay, so Wes, we are coming to our my last question, our last question as a group. What would you like to tell our listeners right now? How do you um, ask people to live their best life? So you, you see people that come into your gym, you have the opportunity to see what they need and how they need it, but for people that you might not ever see or ever meet, how do you uh, portray to them and what advice could you give them to live their best life? Ah, yeah. Oh man. <laughs> My advice to anyone, 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 I feel like we can all be better. We can all live a life that is truly amazing to our own standards, but it takes us to know ourselves first. My message um, moving forward in life is just teaching people how to be themselves. Um, being able to accept all the pain that you've been through. Being able to come from a place where you allow that to be, be your strength. Um, and you can, I, I can't see anyone living their best life if they don't know themselves. Because what life are you living? So I, my advice would be Take time to understand who you are, to find the things that you like, find the goals that you want to do and work on those and allow the world to gravitate to that energy that you're pushing out because you're on a constant mission of being a better you. And when you're on a constant mission to better yourself, well, you are literally living your best life every day because you know maybe today you're amazing but tomorrow you can be even better so you keep going in that journey to living your best life because it's never a day that it'll be over until you never wake up wow Wes, that is so powerful thank you hello everyone this is pam pop and i'm alana mueller and we're members of the seven days leadership committee we want to extend a very special thank you to Mindy Corcoran and Wesley Hamilton for such a compelling discussion. To the Seven Days Leadership Committee and volunteers, especially our wonderful Kindness Youth Leadership Team partners, Ms. Grace Anderson and Ms. Rajita Raj Velikaturi, thank you so much for your commitment and your engagement. Appreciation also goes today to Real Media and Brad Burrow for helping us to create a meaningful virtual experience for Seven Days Others Day 2020. And I must extend some extra gratitude to our sponsors. And I'd like to remind everyone that tomorrow is Connect Day. We hope you will take part in seven days related events. You can learn more about all of the activities on our website, 
give7days.org. Thanks so much for joining us today.